podcast where we talk to smart people, but not necessarily done by smart people. That is an awesome question. This one goes down probably on one of my top five. Hey, I like nutrition. I like to eat food. This is the coolest thing ever. We're going to do this forever. I wish I paid more attention in that class. You know, I'm going to be honest. I don't understand that. As a man, I just, I don't get it. Welcome to Welcome smartpeoplepodcast.com. To smartpeoplepodcast.com. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Smart People Podcast, the podcast where you get smart. I'm Chris Stemp. And I'm John Rojas. That is not actually at all our tagline. Yeah, no guarantee on that. I don't know. We just try. We might guarantee it today because you asked and we answered. We're giving them a 100% money back guarantee. <laughs> no, what I'm you saying You downloaded is... this for free if you don't like it. We'll give you free. And then the survey we put out, seriously, your dog squeaker toy? Hey, man, he's busy. But the survey we put out, we said, you know, what do you guys like to hear most? And kind of the brain and what goes on up there was the number one, surprising to us. But so we went out and found what I believe to be one of the best in this field, in this topic. Yeah, this guy blew my mind on, well, pretty much everything that he said. And how great were his explanations? fantastic just for the fact that i don't understand any of the science behind the brain and i felt like i could sit there and talk to him i mean there were a lot of big words that i probably have to go back and look up but he did such a fantastic job of explaining to the layman if you will yeah and the subtitle of his most recent book how our brains make fatty foods orgasm exercise marijuana generosity vodka learning and gambling feel so good how can you not like that I don't know how it fit on the cover. There's <laughs> so many words now uh, yeah. that I read it. Sorry, that's a lot of talking. We interview David Linden. David Linden, PhD, professor in the Department of Neuroscience at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. He serves as the chief editor of the Journal of Neurophysiology. And his last two books, incredible, honestly, I know we make these recommendations a lot, but you should check out at least one of them. Oh, and he also won a silver medal in science from the Independent Publisher Association. So kind of a big deal with his writings. David's written two books, The Accidental Mind, How Brain Evolution Has Given Us Love, Memory, Dreams, and God. The one Chris mentioned, The Compass of Pleasure, How Our Brains Make Fatty Foods, Orgasm, Exercise, Marijuana, marijuana generosity. generosity, Vodka, Learning, and Gambling Feels So Good. It is, it's really incredible stuff. So we're just going to turn it over to him because I know you're itching to. Check us out at smartpeoplepodcast.com. Sign up for the newsletter. Most importantly, tell a friend. If you like it, there's probably others that like it. We're seeing a lot of people subscribe. We're approaching 2 million downloads, which is bizarre. And we just appreciate your feedback, hearing from you, getting crazy guests. Enjoy David Linden. Well, David, again, thank you so much for being on the show. I wanted to kind of start off, as, as we just discussed a little bit ago, your background and what you do. You've written some amazing books. You're a leader in the field of neuroscience. I was hoping you could give us your background in your words. Happy to. So uh, I have two hats. One of them is that I'm a professor of neuroscience at uh, the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine where I run a laboratory that studies the cellular and molecular basis of memory using rats and mice. And then my other hat, as you mentioned, is that I am a writer of books about brain function for a general audience. And so uh, at present, I've published two, one called The Accidental Mind, which is about brain evolution. Its subtitle is How Brain Evolution Has Given Us Love, Memory, Dreams, and God. And then the second book is called The Compass of Pleasure, and it is about how pleasure is instantiated in the brain, and it uh, has to do with things like the brain's responses to food and drugs and sex and gambling, as well as uh, positive things like generosity and learning and meditation. There's so many different ways I want to go. It's kind of tough, but the first thing I want to say is – Something that I've thought about for a long time, and I'm really wondering what your take is. 
I've always kind of said that if the brain is basically just this pile of connections or whatever you want to call it that operate based off of chemicals, right? If, if all it is is everything we take in elicits a chemical response, why don't we just wire ourselves up or hook ourselves up to an IV, pump in some dopamine, and everybody live this perfect existence? <laughs> I, I've really always wondered that. Right. Well, so, you know, or you could just say, well, why doesn't everybody just like eat food and, and, and have sex and drink alcohol or, or smoke weed all day? Or that, yeah. <laughs> yes. And I think the real answer is that uh, there are a lot of ways in which we are hardwired to uh, propagate our genes into the next generation. And so while some of our pleasures can help us do that, we are also hardwired to do things like earn money to get food and eat it and raise our children and, uh, and launch them in the world. So I think the thing to realize about pleasure is to step back and ask, well, you know, if we have a part of the brain, which when it is active, for example, when dopamine is released within this particular structure called the medial forebrain pleasure circuit, and medial just means it's in the middle of the brain and forebrain means that it's toward the front. When dopamine is released within that circuit, we feel a pleasure buzz. And why should we even have that function in the brain? Well, Really, the reason is so that things like eating food and drinking water and having sex uh, are pleasurable, so we will be motivated to do them again and again so that we can survive and get our genes into the next generation. Ultimately, pleasure is a very evolutionarily ancient thing, and uh, it's there to motivate these very basic evolutionarily adaptive behaviors. That actually brings up another good point that I've kind of linked to my, again, you know, preconceptions that probably aren't valid. But do you believe after all the studying you've done on the brain that our sole purpose and we are hardwired, the main thing to, we're here to do is to propagate the species, is to procreate? Well, I mean, I think the thing to realize is that that is what evolution acts Upon, but that doesn't mean that that is the totality of human existence. So, if you're a very simple animal like a worm, you have a few dopamine neurons, and when you're wriggling through the soil and you eat a clump of bacteria, which is like a really good time for a worm, then your dopamine neurons will fire and you'll feel pleasure and you'll be motivated to do it again. And for a worm, you're, uh, you have very little capacity to learn, just a little bit. And uh, most of your actions are fairly hardwired. Uh, for humans, it gets much more complicated. We have this evolutionarily ancient pleasure circuit that is there so that eating food, drinking water, and having sex are pleasurable. But clever us, we figured out a couple of things. One thing is that we figured out how to activate it artificially using things like nicotine and alcohol and cannabis and cocaine and amphetamine and heroin, things of that nature. So we figured out how to short circuit it with substances. And some other animals have figured out how to do this too. But I think even more importantly, when we, we start to think more philosophically about the meaning of human existence, a lot of it is motivated. A lot of what makes human existence so interesting and rich comes from the fact that this very ancient pleasure circuit is interconnected with higher areas of the brain, having to do with social cognition, emotion, uh, motivation, and memory. And as a consequence for us, entirely random things that have no evolutionary survival value at all can be pleasurable right? Celebrity gossip is pleasurable. Does it do us, help us get our genes in the next generation? Not at all. The sport of curling is pleasurable. <laughs> next generation? No, it's, it, it's not. Even ideas can activate the pleasure circuit in a human. Even ideas that are counter to the things that we normally think of as fundamental for our survival. So, for example, a mouse can get pleasure by having sex or eating food, but only a human can get pleasure out of abstaining from sex or fasting if they have a certain set of religious or political or 
or social cultural ideas surrounding those acts. So it is the ability of this ancient pleasure circuit to interface with these higher areas of the brain that I believe is ultimately the basis of so much of what is rich and interesting and, and wonderful and not easily explainable in evolutionary terms in human culture. That's absolutely fascinating. And it, that kind of leads into one of the questions that I had for me, and I know Chris, gambling sends off such a, <laughs> such a rush, but there are people that when I talk to about gambling, they're like, oh, I hate gambling. The feeling of losing or winning is both awful to me. I don't enjoy it. How are some people driven by certain pleasures and others not? And like what you just said about the the religious aspect of things from abstaining from sex actually releasing dopamine? Well, so that is a great question. The short answer to the question of, well, why do some people take pleasure in gambling and other people it does nothing for or is actively aversive? Why other people take their pleasure from eating uh, fatty food and other people take their pleasure from you know alcohol? In truth, in a broad sense, we don't know. We really don't know what it is that causes people to focus in on particular pleasures. Now, what we do know is something more general. We know that the propensity for addiction, whether it is addiction to a substance like alcohol or food and obesity most of the time, 90% of the time is essentially food addiction, or to a behavior like gambling, all of this propensity to addiction, about 40% of the variation of that is accounted for by the genes that you inherit from your mother and father. Now, there's no single addiction gene. But not surprisingly, some of the genes where if you inherit a certain variant, you're more likely to be an addict uh, those genes involve dopamine signaling. So, for example, there's something called the uh, D2 dopamine receptor, and if you inherit a certain variant of it, then you are more likely to become an addict in general. But it doesn't tell us whether you are going to happen to become a gambling addict versus a food addict versus a heroin addict. And the one thing that we do know is that while there are a lot of people who have one addiction or another – there are also a lot of people that have a generally addictive personality. So, for example, if you go to a casino and you find the people who are gambling uncontrollably, those people will have a much higher incidence of other addictions like food or alcohol or tobacco or, or cocaine, for example. With a lot of people that are addicts, when they give up, say they're a drug addict and they kick something and they replace, are they just replacing it with some other feeling that they're addicted to? I mean, whether it be exercise or meditation or something like that, do they need to replace that addiction to get rid of the quote unquote bad one? Well, so that's a great question. So it turns out that these, these variants that you inherit that make you more likely to become an addict, they actually all function by dampening the signaling of dopamine within the brain's pleasure circuit. So, for example, I'm lucky enough not to have an addictive personality, and I can go to the tavern and have two whiskeys and feel happy and, uh, and, and be done. And my friend Ned... Uh, who is fictional, who I've just made up for this purpose. Uh, he, uh, in order to get the same amount of pleasure that I do from two whiskeys, he might have to have 10 whiskeys, right? Because he inherited gene variants that make his dopamine system less efficient. Now, back to the question of what happens then in the course of addiction. Well, it turns out if if we were to to do an experiment, let's say that we had an alcohol addict and a gambling addict and a sex addict. And we had them write the story of their addiction. But then before we read it, we hired someone, say an undergraduate who worked for not very much money, to edit out all the words that made specific reference to, to, to sex or, or, or heroin or gambling. What we would see is that what's left is the same story. And the, and the story goes like this. Oh, I did this thing and it felt really good, so I did it some more and that was great. And then as I did it more and more, I found that I needed to do it more often or a higher dose or more frequently in order to get the same amount of pleasure that I got from, from more moderate consumption earlier. And then as time went on, 
something even more insidious happened, and that is all my wanting was transformed into liking. That is to say, the pleasure all leached away, and in the end, all I was left with was the craving. And so what you find is that late-stage addicts, uh, whether they be to heroin or anything else, are no longer doing their addictive behavior because it brings them pleasure. Rather, they're doing it to avoid the withdrawal symptoms so that they cannot have a panic attack, so they can fall asleep at night, so that they cannot feel itching or uncontrollable anxiety or so on. Now, it turns out that when your addiction has gone through all those stages and you have reached that, and even if you are then staying clean and you were in recovery for months or years, all the indications are that your brain is actually permanently rewired, that once you go through that addiction, the pleasure circuits of your brain are changed forever. And this is part of the reason why relapse of addiction is so, is so common, why it's so hard to uh, kick addictive behaviors. So to get then to your question, well, are, are people just replacing one thing with another? Well, not everyone does, but in a way it can be a good thing to do. So we all need a certain amount of pleasure, and, and the best strategy is to take a lot of different pleasures, both your vices and your virtues, and to partake of a large number of them moderately. <laughs> and a lot of folks will, will substitute one thing for another. And an example that I use in my book, which is a well-known one, comes from Jeff Tweedy, the lead singer of Wilco. And uh, he battled an addiction uh, to alcohol and, and prescription uh, drugs for many years. He kicked it. He got clean. And uh, then he became such an obsessive runner that he got fractures in both of his legs. And so, you know, he did trade one sort of euphoric behavior for another. On the end, I think he's much better off as a, an obsessive runner than, than, than he is uh, abusing those substances. But certainly that trade-off of pleasures can happen, just as you said. That was an amazing explanation. I really appreciate that. And in you doing so, I kind of reaffirmed that I know I have an addictive personality. Since I can remember, my dad has always said, your motto is, plain and simply, anything worth doing is worth overdoing. Uh -huh. And I know that. So for that reason, I purposely abstained from things that I thought were a negative addiction, such as tobacco or, um, I don't know, cocaine or something <laughs> like that. Gambling slipped through the cracks a little bit. But two questions I have for you are, one, if you have an addictive personality, does that mean, as you kind of mentioned earlier, you have a less efficient dopamine system? And if that is the case, is there a way to reprogram your brain? I mean, like you just said, maybe try to do a lot more things on a moderate level, I think might be one. I really just want to get your personal opinion so I can help myself. Well, so I think there are several things that we know that we can give advice for people based on the neuroscience of the brain's pleasure circuit for, for people who are in recovery and looking to, uh, to stay clean or who are worried about falling into addiction. First of all, we know that addiction and relapse tend to happen not so much during the good times, but during the bad times. Stress is a trigger for addiction. And you might think, oh, now he's taken off his biologist hat and he sounds like a psychologist. But the truth is we know a very explicit biology that underlies this. So, for example, if you have any one of a number of different kinds of stress, if you have an argument with your sweetheart or if you're sacked from your job or if you're fighting off uh, a flu, all of those things uh, are stresses and they will all cause your adrenal glands that sit on top of your kidneys to secrete stress hormones and those stress hormones will pass into your bloodstream and they'll pass into your brain and they will bind receptors on neurons within your brain's pleasure circuit and they will set in motion uh, some biochemical changes that will ultimately make you crave. Hmm. So what does that all mean for someone who's wanting to stay clean? It means that what you need to do is to actively engage every day in stress reduction behaviors. No one can live a stress-free life. There are always stresses in life, no matter how lucky you are. And so if you know you are at a risk of developing addiction or relapsing, then you want to, into your daily schedule, 
put something that you know is a stress reducer for you. And that could be playing with your dog. It could be going for a run. It could be prayer. It could be meditation. Lots of different things work. There's no, there's no one thing. But actively engaging in stress reduction is something that we know is a, uh, is a good strategy for reducing the probability of relapse. And as we said, spreading your, your, your pleasures around, incorporating both uh, vices in moderation, uh, but also virtuous behaviors that we know are rewarding, like uh, doing charitable work and learning, both of which we know activate the brain's pleasure circuitry. These things are, uh, are also good. I keep thinking about the fact that when I come home or I know when John comes home or my fiance from a from a stressful day of work, the first thing most people, a lot of people, I can't I don't want to generalize, tend to do is go to that vice and say it's, you know, most easily because it's legal and everything, alcohol. Do we seek to get to a certain level of pleasure? I mean, are we just trying to self-medicate through things, through, I don't know, drugs or whatever they might be, just to reach a, a balance almost in our brain? What I can say is that when you have that stressful day and you come home and those stress hormones are circulating and they're acting on your brain's pressure circuit, it's making you crave. Whether that you want to call that self-medication or, or seeking some balance or not, I don't know. I mean, I'll just describe it in terms of the biology and leave it at that. It brings up something that I think is important, though, to mention. Well, so first of all, if 40% of the propensity for addiction is genetic, that leaves a whole lot of other 60% of things that can happen. And stress is life stress, actually even starting in utero. So if your mother was stressed while she was carrying you, you actually carry a higher rate through your life of mm -hmm. propensity for addiction. But throughout your entire life. Stress is the number one non-genetic thing that contributes to addiction. The other thing that we should keep in mind is, you know, you might think, well, if addiction is bad and it's genetic, why hasn't it just been selected out over the years? Why, why does it still exist at all? And the answer is twofold. First of all, most addicts can still have children and their addiction might not select them out of the, the gene pool until after they've done that. And basically, once you've had your kids and raised them up a little bit, evolution doesn't care about you anymore. I mean, a little bit to the extent that you contribute to uh, your grandchildren and your nieces and your nephews, but it's a much more minor effect. The other thing to realize is that these gene variants that make you more likely to be an uh, addict also confer a set of personality traits that can be beneficial. So for example, this variant of the D2 dopamine receptor that I mentioned, well, that makes you more novelty seeking and more risk taking and more obsessive. Well, when you think about it, what have we just described? We've just described uh, a good entrepreneur. I was just about to say an entrepreneur. Definitely. Right. You know, described Steve Jobs or someone of that nature, right? So part of the reason why these traits persist is because in many aspects of life, the same genetic variation that leads you more at risk for addiction can also benefit you, particularly in your career. I, I wrote an op-ed for the New York Times uh, a couple of years ago based on this called Why Your Next Visionary CEO Should Be an Addict, and <laughs> precisely this point. I want to ask you, first and foremost, because I really think, and I know you are one of the most well-studied, well-versed in this realm, how much do you think we actually know about the brain? I mean, if you could put a percentage, say, you know, uh, 100 being we know everything there is, where do you think we stand as a, as a species, as a science? Well, that's a great question because the truth is we don't know what we don't know. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. So it's hard to say. But, you know, usually when brain researchers are polled about this, uh, most brain researchers will say something like 10% or 20%. Wow. And I would say I would agree with that. But, you know, in truth, we don't know what we don't know, right? There are still fundamental aspects of brain function that are unclear to us. There are still things that I was taught in college and in graduate school that we thought we really knew that turned out to be absolutely 100% dead wrong. To give you one example, right, for addiction, for years it was thought, well, addicts have genetic variants that make their reward circuit work better, right? <laughs> if you take a drink, 
and it, only, and it feels fantastic to you, but only so-so to someone else, then the person who feels fantastic from it is going to do it more and more. And that's a completely reasonable hypothesis that turned out to be 180 degrees dead wrong. And there are many things that we think of as being fairly confident about the brain now that will turn out to be equally wrong. Has there been anything in the last 5, 10, 20 years that has just turned the study of the brain on its head? Well, I would say here's something that I think is really interesting that has changed my mind a lot in the field of memory. So it used to be thought that memory was kind of like a hard drive or a card catalog. You had experiences, you wrote them into memory, and there they would sit. And maybe they would degrade a little bit slowly with time, but basically they would sit there, and then when you needed to, you would look them up again. And that was the idea that was had for many years. We now know, however, that every time you recollect a memory, you render it a little fluid and a little subject to variation. So the mere act of recollecting a memory can change it subtly and degrade it or warp it. And this is one of the reasons why our memories are really actually very bad, why uh, things like uh, eyewitness testimony and trials is notoriously bad. It turns out that if you ask someone, like in a police station, to recall something a law, you know, many, many times, and you are kind of feeding them little clues and ideas about the way they should be thinking, then you'll change their memory. And it's not. You are literally changing the way it's encoded in their brain. I, I think that is a fundamentally new idea that has come out in the last 15 years. Speaking of memory, I read something fairly recently that it just stuck with me. Because I don't think most people question, where do memories come from? Like, where are they stored, right? It's a, it's a filing cabinet, almost, of experiences. That is, you're constantly taking them in. I mean, I'm 30 years old. I have 30 years of things that have happened every millisecond. And I can recall some of them, or at least think I can. Is there any way you can, in layman's terms, describe how memory works? How can I recall something from 20 years ago? Well, this is still very much a mystery, but the general idea appears to be this. Memory, first of all, is not a unitary phenomenon. It turns out that the kind of memory that you have for facts, things like uh, the president before Obama was George W. Bush, or events, when I was three years old, I was taken to the zoo and I saw a crocodile. <laughs> Those sorts of things are one memory system, and then you have a whole other memory system for things that you can't declare, things like associations or motor learning, getting better at ping pong, uh, things of that nature. And these are stored in different ways in the brain. The memories for facts and events uh, appear to be stored as changes in the ultimately the electrical function of interconnected neurons in the brain. Uh, facts and events seem to be initially stored in uh, a region called the hippocampus and some, initial, some surrounding structures in the temporal lobe. And then with time in humans over a couple of years, those memories seem to be exported to a larger area on the surface of the brain called the neocortex. And it seems as if the different sensory aspects of a memory are stored somehow by changes in the neurons in the sensory cortex that was involved in processing them. So, for example, part of your cortex is involved in vision and part of it in hearing and part of it in touch. So if you have a memory of that day on the beach and you remember the smell of the seaweed and the sound of the waves and the feel of the hot sound on your feet, well, those different aspects of the memory are stored in the different parts of your neocortex that initially encoded those sensations, the vision part, the hearing part, the touch part. You're blowing I, our brains. It really is. <laughs> I, I'm saying, I mean, we've done, you know, 100 plus interviews and these, these types of things are just so incredible. And we took a survey recently of listeners and um, the brain and, and the study of the brain was the number one thing that people wanted to learn about, which I find fascinating, right? I mean, as you mentioned, you think we might have discovered 10, 20% of the brain. There's not much out there that professionals and and people that really own the field will say, uh, we only know about 20% of. 
It's the last well, frontier but there, almost. But there are some other things. So, for example, we le- know less than 20% of the species of bacteria on the planet. We mm-hmm. know less than 20% of the number of bugs that exist in the world. Good point. So neuroscience is wonderful, and I'm happy to be a neuroscientist, but it's not the only frontier. Right. It is just one cool frontier. <laughs> it is a real – I mean, and the thing is, a bug, right, that's like – it's it's out there, it's crawling, it's an external thing. But the brain potentially runs everything you do. So I think people have a little bit more of a vested <laughs> interest. Well, I think they do, and you know that's good for someone like me who writes books about it. Because, <laughs> I mean, let's face it. You know, you've got different kinds of book buying audience. You've got your science fans, right? The kind of people who might read Wired uh, or Scientific American, and they already like all kinds of science. And they might buy a book about the brain or a book about evolution or or math or physics or or what have you. And they're already you're already preaching to the choir. But there are another group of people who might only the only science book they might ever buy would be one that's about human behavior. And so when you write a book about uh, the biology of behavior and brain function, you have a chance to reach an audience that might never, ever buy a book about any other aspect of science. And to me, that's 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 very exciting. And uh, uh, that's what I strive to do. I completely agree. And actually, that's a perfect lead in because I want to talk about your book, The Compass of Pleasure. I mean, phenomenal book. This interview is just a a snippet of what you cover. And so many people, it's, it's such a personal topic because it's part of their world, how they interact, why they like certain things. You know, what did you find most interesting through writing the book? What did you work through and in the end go, wow, that was awesome? Well, that's a, uh, that's a great question. I think, for me, one of the most interesting aspects of writing the book was having the realization of how central the experience of pleasure is to our humanity. This guides us in all kinds of ways, and it is central also to how we conceive of other people, Right. So let me give you an example, uh, something that I encounter all the time. These days, most people are willing to say, well, something like alcohol addiction is a disease, right? And uh, it's not just something that happens to people who have no willpower and uh, are uh, inferior, right? So that said, you know, so if you go, if you go to the doctor, right? And you have heart disease. We don't say you suck. You have heart, disease. <laughs> right? You're you're weak will. Do have heart disease? No. We say you've got a problem with your heart, and it's not your fault, but it's your problem. And so, if you want to get better, then you got to take these safe and effective meds. You've got to watch your diet. You've got to exercise. And if you don't do those things, it's not society's fault. It's your own darn fault. And that should be our same approach to addicts. We should say, look, you have something wrong with your brain, just like that other guy had wrong with his heart. You don't suck. You are not inferior, but it is your problem. And you need to get into a treatment program. You need to take anti-craving drugs where they're safe and effective. You need to avoid the triggers for your addiction. You need to actively engage in stress reduction strategies. And if you don't do those things, it's not society's fault. I'm not going to just say, go ahead, steal the radio out of my car, Mr. Addict. I'm going to say, it's your fault. Now, the thing is, a lot of us accept this for something like drugs, but we are far less willing to accept it for something like food, right? So it turns out that 90% of the cases of obesity are not because people have low metabolisms. It's because people eat more. And, you know, I'd say, oh, look at that fat guy. Why doesn't he just exercise more and eat less? And uh, you, you you might think to yourself, well, I was gaining a little weight and I did it and it was easy and it worked for me. It was no problem. So why can't they do it? And the truth is that each of us are wired up differently as a result of our genetics, as a result of our life experience, any one of us could become an addict and every, any one of us could become an addict who overeats. If you go look at human traits, the most heritable human trait, the one that's most predicted by your parents is height. The second most heritable human trait is body mass index. 
5% of the variability in body mass index is accounted for by your genes. Nonetheless, if you go look on in the media, right, the way we portray people who are overweight is that they are failures, they are weak-willed, they have a loss of, of control because after all, I could eat less and exercise and lose some weight, so why couldn't they? It's a very hard thing to do to put oneself in someone else's brain. And I think to me that was the most central point that emerged when I wrote the book, The Compass of Pleasure. I love that. I really do. It kind of uh, speaks to having a little bit of empathy and just understanding of everybody has their their things. I mean, that's what makes us individuals. I had one major question for you before just getting into a quick lightning round, and that was, what is your opinion, you mentioned it, on prescription drugs that might be anti-addict, as you mentioned, or anti-anxiety or depression, things that modify our chemistry that we have now figured out ways to make somebody who might be depressed a little happier and things like that. Do you, do you think that that is a beneficial thing for all of society and almost a natural progression? Or is that we're tinkering with things that we might not know enough about? Well, I believe very strongly that there are uh, psychiatric drugs that can really uh, help people enormously. Uh, right now, we have a, a generation of antidepressants that give a lot of relief to a lot of people. They don't give relief to anyone. There are some people who, who are essentially immune to the benefits of the modern antidepressant drugs, the SSRIs. But if you, I'm old enough to remember the bad old days when there really weren't any effective antidepressants. And the thing we have to realize, and uh, I am the son of a psychoanalyst, so I grew up in this, very much in this tradition, is that these antidepressant drugs work by changing the brain. Talk therapy, when it works, also works by changing the brain. The mm -hmm. fact that one works and the other works, these things, it's not like these things are, are completely irreconcilable. But what happens is that people who are severely depressed, when you try to benefit them from talk therapy, a lot of times they are in so much pain that they can't even get traction with talk therapy. They can't focus enough to get the benefit of how that works. And for a lot of people, taking a modern antidepressant drug can dull the pain enough, even if it doesn't completely relieve it, enough that talk therapy can start to get some traction, like wheels spinning on an icy road, they can start to bite, and then the two can work together. Uh, so I'm actually very pro-antidepressant drugs, and obviously they can be overused like, like any drug can, but I think on the whole, they've been enormously beneficial. Right now... The drugs that we have to blunt cravings for people who are trying to stay clean, uh, who, are, who are struggling uh, with, uh, with addiction, are basically where we were with antidepressants in the 1960s. In other words, we have, just have a couple of drugs and they don't work very well uh, at all. 20 years from now, we're going to have drugs to blunt cravings that are much, much, much better. And as a consequence, uh, the treatment of addiction... Uh, which is really kind of a misery right now. And, and you know, most people who go into addiction treatment relapse and relapse and relapse and relapse. That is going to be changed to the same degree that depression treatment was changed by the modern antidepressant drugs. I appreciate that. That was a really great explanation, especially, you know, of your thoughts, somebody who's living it, eating it, breathing it. Uh, lastly, just some very quick questions, you know, simple answers. What is the last great book that you have read? The last great book that I have read, I love to read fiction. And the last great book that I read was called uh, Moth Smoke by Mohsin Hamid, a writer from Pakistan who is uh, absolutely wonderful. That's awesome. We don't get too many people recommend fiction, so I love that. That was definitely a, a nice curveball. What is the best advice you have for the intellectually curious? The best advice I have for the intellectually curious, don't be afraid to wade into an area where you're not an expert. The problem with experts is a lot of times they grow up in an environment where they only talk to other experts, right? 
I'm a neurobiologist. I work at a medical school. I spend all day talking to scientists and doctors. I'm interested in memory. Well, I can learn about a lot about memory from someone who studies literature or anthropology or economics, for example. And someone in those fields can learn a lot from me. And anyone who is intellectually curious in this day and age with such great access to information can wade in and start doing the work of an intellectual. You don't have to be uh, in a lab or at a university or, 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 or have that uh, be your full-time day job. Everyone can contribute to this endeavor. And with the Internet, everyone can share it. It's such a great answer, something that we strive to do and connect with people that are just interested and feel like they can go ahead and ask questions and not be intimidated. David, I really appreciate being on the show. Incredible insight. And let's not look over your your older book, The Accidental Mind, How Brain Evolution Has Given Us Love, Memory, Dreams, and God. Incredible. And then The Compass of Pleasure, it's just, again... I can't recommend it enough to everyone else. I can't wait to see what comes out next from you. Really looking forward to it. Where else can people go learn about you, what you're doing? Are you are you writing more for newspapers or magazines or on a blog, anything like that? Well, one thing people can do is they can go to my uh, website, which does have a very intermittent blog on it, which is davidlinden.org. And uh, the other thing I can do is they can uh, wait until the spring of 2015 when my new book will be coming out from Viking Press about the sense of touch. And uh, we don't know what the final title will be, but the uh, temporary title, uh, which may be changed by the publisher, is How Do You Feel? <laughs> I like that. that, that, that <laughs> That's actually, really cool. That is. And we will definitely happily have you back on anytime, especially before that comes out. Thank you so much for being generous with your time, and uh, we really appreciate it. Okay. Thanks very much. Have a good evening. All right. You too. too. I hope you guys found that interview with David Linden as fantastic as Chris and I did. Head over to davidlinden.org to find out more about him. You can see his books. He's got a blog on there, his events. There's different media clips, all kinds of stuff. Anything you'd want to know about him and his writings, it's all there. Is that a picture of monkeys boning on his website? I don't know if they're boning or just... Oh, really? They're, they're cuddling in the missionary position? They might be hanging out. I don't know. It depends on how you look at it. If you turn your head, it just I'm... looks like they're staring lovingly into each other's eyes. I'm pretty sure that's a monkey boob. Right? Is that a monkey boob? That does look like a monkey teat. That's either a teat or an enormous pectoral. Yeah, it, it might be. Wow. Really lost topic way, there. Way to derail. We say this at the end, but sometimes people are listening. Really appreciate you guys tuning in. I have people actually, friends of mine and people I've just connected with texting me now on Monday nights. John, I didn't even tell you this. Saying, oh, you here's how I felt about your last episode. Good, bad, ugly, great, whatever. And that's pretty awesome. So if you want to hit us up, smartpeoplepodcast at gmail.com or connect with us on the website, let us know what you think. We're, we're here to serve. Yeah, head over to iTunes, leave us a review, a comment, a star rating, any of that great stuff that you guys have been doing for us for the past however many months. We Three really, years. Yeah, well, it's really picked up over the past few months, which is great. And it's helped us move up on the charts. I know we're staying up there now in the education section. And anybody that nominated us, for the podcast Killer. awards uh thank you so much we'll see what happens here see if we make it again this year but if, if we don't make it uh, i quit well that's fine but if we do make it we'll be reaching out again and asking for you to vote for us every day smart people podcast out you're not gonna use that are you no no